church. I love this family. I love our God. It's just amazing to be here this morning. And my sister's over there playing. What a wonderful change has come over me. Hallelujah. What a befitting song for what just took place. Pastor, please accept my humble apologies for causing you one second of stress by you looking out and I wasn't <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I look around this morning and I'm just oh, I'm just full to the brim. I look around, I see growth. Have you noticed how energizing growth is just the energy that we need over it to see a new focus, new blood, new ideas, new energy just being blessed into our house by God of love because he's the only one who grants increase. So for every one of you who have recently joined, again I say, I love you, welcome. We are so blessed in Macedonia that you are now here with us and part of our family. And we do so love you. This morning, I started to think, oh, as the pastor asked me to speak, what was I going to say? And for a couple of days, Pastor, I kept saying, Lord, what do you want to say? <laughs> what do you want me to say? And he put a thought in my mind that is scriptural, and that's where I'm going to go for just a short period of time. And that thought is, what does God require? Let's bow our heads. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We thank you for everything our ears have heard, our eyes have seen, have seen and what you have placed in our spirit, spirit joined spirit. And so we say hallelujah, thank you, God, for the great thing that you have done. And now, Father God, through me speak to this, your waiting people. Send your word out that it does not come back void unto thee, and that the increase that you desire is seen and manifested in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I'm going to ask if you would just bear with me for about 20 minutes. And so in my, you know, this pastor said, all right, that's within the time limit, you know, so, um, <laughs> Micah, the sixth chapter and the eighth verse, it says, he, God, has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I think oftentimes, and especially as I address the young people in the audience, we tend to make Christianity a burden rather than a joy. And I say a joy because as we grow in grace, as we learn more, as we activate that which is within our faith, and as we activate our faith to higher and higher levels, to greater and greater trials and tribulations, what we find out is that our faith, our Christian faith, is liberating. It's actually freedom. It's not a way to be mourned and born with a sour face where you walk around because you want to look holy. You can't smile, you can't laugh, you can't. Your cake. It's all about the cakes. That's not Christianity. Christianity is all about the can do's through Christ Jesus. When we look at the text, and I want to put it in context because actually it's a message to a sovereign over his kingdom as he prays to God for uh, assurance of deliverance from an impending judgment that is about to occur. And so the prophet Micah has already given the judgment and the, the scene is set. And the sovereign does not know what to do. He's afraid that his city is about to be besieged and is going to be obliterated. And so he goes to the temple and he prays. And in response to this conversation between God and man, we get this scripture. So if you look at it in one context, we can look at it and say this is a mandate or a scripture to a nation. So, let me back up. Because we live in a nation. Nations are made up of individuals, right? And so, by inference, we can take what's meant for the nation and bring it down to us as individuals. But I want to kind of tell you, if you would allow me to just read this, because I thought 
father was eloquently put, and it was succinct. Pretty much the same thing was happening then as that's happening now. And my commentary says, the wealthy enjoyed themselves at the expense of the poor. Anybody been to the grocery store yet? Behavior that did not sit well with God or with his prophets. The rich seized property. Have you heard of eminent domain? Have you heard of gentrification? Have you heard that we're bringing through new transportation 10 blocks away from the last transportation that we brought through, but it's going to cost you your home. Oh, and by the way, we're paying 50 cents on the dollar. Uh, many priests were reduced to uh, worship merely in ritual and tradition, not actually worshiping to God. It was designed to manipulate God, civil and religious leaders, and they neglected doing what they should and persisted in doing what they should not. And again, idolatry was pervasive. That's the time that they were in. Not much different from our political climate in America. So if this is to be put out as an address to a nation, well, we can take it there. But today I want to address you as an individual, especially our young people. You are on the verge of your careers. You are in your careers. You are making strides. You are in your educational careers. You are going from level to level, from tier to tier. You are striving for excellence, and I dare say that many of you are accomplishing just that. And so with all of that, you are bombarded with different cultures. You have a culture here, a culture here, and a culture there. And as you matriculate your way through the world, you go <coughs> up against all of them. And so it requires you to know if I'm going to fit in over here, what do they want from me? If I'm going to fit in over here, what do they want from me? And as you look at that and you come to church on Sundays, you start to think, if you haven't already, can I take Sunday with me on Saturday where I'm going? Can I take my Sunday with me on Friday? Or am I taking my Friday with me on my Sunday? How does this all mix in? And at some point, at least for me, umpteen years ago, the lines got blurred. But I can tell you one thing. Having been brought up in a Christian home with Christian principles, the lines may have gotten blurred, but the standard stood straight. And whenever there was cloudiness or there was trouble, I could always see that standard because it seemed like it was always looking at me. So let's go back to the question. What is it that God requires? Does it require that you show up for choir rehearsal on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock? Does it require that you wear dresses down to your knees? Does it require that you not go out on Friday and Saturday night? What exactly is it that God requires of you. I'm going to tell you because I'm glad you asked. The good news before I even tell you what is required, I will tell you this. Whatever God will ever require of you in all your life, He will always <coughs> never fail. He will always make provision for you to carry out that which he requires. You don't ever have to worry about where it's coming from. If he requires you to be holy, understand that he's already made provision for you to be holy. If he requires that you be righteous, that provision has already been made for you to be righteous. Well, Sister Brown, how does that show up? I'm going to answer that in a minute. Put a pen in it. So the Lord requires you to do. As you read your Bible, pay attention to the small words, the little verbs, you know, uh, those, those, those little adverbs. And they pay attention to those, those pronouns. They, they change scripture. He doesn't say that he requires you to believe justly. He says he requires you to do. 
That means you must want, know what justice is in any given circumstance, in any given situation. And that justice being justice according to man's law and the Bible. Secondly, it requires you to act. You cannot sit as an innocent bystander. If you remain silent in the face of injustice, then you may as well have committed the injustice. Your silence condones whatever it is that you are not speaking against. If you remain silent, you condone injustice. You must do. You speak. There's a slogan out now, I think it says something like, if you see it, speak up. You must do. You cannot remain an inactive participant. What is justice? Justice is based in law. When there's a transgression in law, there's always a penalty. When justice is delivered, justice is delivered in humankind. And so you take the law, you take the infraction, you take the transgression, and you deliver the prescribed antidote according to law. However, there's such a thing as judicial discretion. In Christianity, we call that mercy. Whenever you see justice, what you want to see is the law equitably applied. You want to see it applied according to the degree of the injustice that has been done. And you want it to be applied the way you would like to be treated yourself. So what does that mean when you're walking out your faith? That means that you want the person that you're looking at to have as much grace and mercy as you would desire for yourself in the same situation, and that you are an active participant whenever possible in seeing that that occurs. That is to do justly. Then you want to love mercy. Those are two big words that are so, so intertwined. One cannot have mercy without love, and you can't have love without mercy. If I love you, Sister Mary, I'm going to give you some grace, and I'm going to give you some mercy. My love compels me to do so. And if I have mercy, regardless of upon whom I'm given, you can't say I'm bigoted if I'm given mercy. In me is a grain of love because mercy does not stem from hate. So what is it that I must love mercy? That means everybody that I meet, wherever I meet them, whenever I meet them, no matter how they look, I look at them and say, but for the grace of God go I, and I reach into the depths of the love that God has in me, and I bestow upon them mercy, because mercy would suit my case where I am that situation. So we are to do justly and we are to love mercy. And then lastly, we are to walk humbly before our God. Now we say amen in the house from a humble man. What does that mean? And pay attention again to those small words. Before God. Does that translate to before Men, it will when you do it, and you do it as unto the Lord. It is not that I see myself as not being good or not being great, that I don't go around boasting. It is simply that that is not required of me. I choose to be humble by choice so that God does not have to bring me down. I don't want to, to fall into the hands of an angry God. I don't want him to have to remind me that I'm not all I think I am. I'm nowhere near what he intended me to be. And I'm sure not everything y'all say and crack somebody me up to be. That's not me. Humbly is to not boast, but to take pleasure, to take joy in giving God all the credit for all and everything that he 
does in your life. Whether it be to attain a master's degree, a, a lowly undergraduate degree, or whether it is to attain the heights of one doctorate, two doctorate, three doctorate, whether it be to gain fame in the world for the gift that God has given you, for the talent that God has given and graced you to actually develop to the point that somebody else notices, whatever it might be, whether it be to be a divider of the word that can expound the word simply, accurately, with power to save, with power to renew, with power to regenerate, whatever it be. Humbling means you go before God and say, Lord, here I am, send me, Lord, here I am, a meek and humble vessel, fill me that I might fulfill the destiny that you have for me. When we do those things, the next question is, well, can I take Friday? I don't have to answer that for you. Because when Sunday takes you, you won't worry about Friday, you won't worry about Saturday. What does that look like in your life? It's simple. We don't go around boasting, but we go around doing what I heard in the prayer, one person at a time. We reach out to our family and we fill the balcony and say, come be with me on Sunday morning. We walk in our chosen professions, and wherever we walk, whether it be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, morning, noon, or night, we go about humbly proclaiming, I am a child of God. I am empowered by the Holy Spirit to do those things that he has placed in me through his power, and only through his power, to his glory and for our benefit. And all the people of God said, Amen. Yeah.